Oh, I guess I need to switch that on, right? Okay, hello everybody. Um, I hope you're enjoying Dachfest as much as I do. I will be sharing something about designing socially acceptable wearables, my PhD research, and also something about how ideas evolve or how we can encourage novel ideas to develop. Uh, as said, I'm a researcher in human-computer interaction and a PhD student at the University of Oldenburg. I'm mostly interested in how today's computers are used in real-life social contexts. And as you can see here on the images, I have been uh, working a lot with augmented reality in the past, which uh, was a journey which actually started here in Munich at TUM, LMU and also at Mateo. And as you can guess, uh, working with augmented reality, I was super excited when the first smart glasses became publicly or commercially available. I was thinking of, oh wow, we could do such cool projects to really yeah, help people in their everyday lives. Like, well, let's do hands-free navigation aids or just capture memories that might be otherwise just fleeting moments, or even help people navigating, do some kind of assistive technology that can improve accessibility. But, well, um, I was kind of disappointed because it turned out that smart glasses were not really socially acceptable. And actually, this is true for many of the most innovative and exciting interfaces we design and engineer. They just turn out to be not socially acceptable. And public discussion often ends up with, OK, uh, let's just raise a complete ban of those devices or allow everything, which also doesn't make people happy. And of course, having all those cool interfaces, we might be able to develop in the future in mind, I was not happy about the thought of a complete ban of those devices. So I wanted to find out what actually made those devices, particularly wearable devices with integrated cameras, what made them so socially unacceptable. So why are wearable cameras, or let's say wearable devices that do have a seemingly always-on camera integrated, why are they not socially acceptable? We conducted some research on that. So we conducted user studies, interviews, focus groups, and of course we also lo looked into what other researchers before us had found. And it turned out that there's a conflict bit underlying all that social non-acceptance. It's conflicting needs of users of such devices and bystanders. So let's together have a closer look at this. What might these be? So we have a user and we have a bystander and they have different needs and wants. And for example, our user wants to use the functionality of his or her device. So they might want to make use of some kind of tracking technology to maybe get a better localization than GPS would be able to deliver. On the other hand, we have our bystanders. They might have privacy concerns. So they just don't want to have the feeling that they might show up in someone else's video stream or be recorded. Although it just might be using cameras as a sensor for tracking. Moreover, pri um, bystanders might perceive a lack of control, so they don't really have a say in whether they're being captured by a wearable camera or not. The only thing they might be able to do is address the user directly, which of course can be difficult. And the user, on the other hand, wants to have comfort and not an impaired user experience from having to worry about asking everybody, everybody around for consent before using his or her device. And last but not least, we have a lack of notice on the bystander side. 
So if someone's wearing a seemingly always on camera, bystanders typically can tell whether this camera is turned on or off. And this also leads to a lack of justification on the user side. So they might be wearing this device, not recording anything, but still have the feeling that everybody else is judging them and might think they're doing something illegal, doing suspicious recordings. And in my research, we decided to have a look, closer look at those. So we wanted to tackle these issues of notice and justification by looking into privacy indicators for body-worn cameras. And of course, this is not only true for smart glasses or camera clips you might wear. As you can also see on this picture, it's just basically true for most cameras we're carrying around with us. There's just no indicator whether a camera is turned on or off. So as we are researchers in human-computer interaction, we work with humans or users. So our idea was let's work with users and potential bystanders together to find solutions. But we uncovered a problem. We were running co-design sessions and we figured out that when we asked for potential ideas for privacy indicators for those body-worn cameras, our participants circled around one design solution they already knew, LED status lights. And well, why is this not a good idea? I mean, LEDs are great. We have had a lot of great talks on colored LEDs, but they don't work for all use cases. So why not stick with it for privacy indicators for that kind of devices? Well, one thing is LED status indicators are not necessarily well noticeable. This means if it's turned off, bystanders might have no clue where they actually should expect a point light or an LED to lit up if there would be something that would record them. In addition, they're not always fully understood, even if they're lit up. So that means LED status lights are often not mentally linked to the recording functionality of the camera, so it's that recording is not understood by bystanders. And moreover, LEDs can be easily desoldered, dewired, just painted over or masked. So in consequence, they're actually <coughs> spoofable and thus might be perceived as untrustworthy. How many people here are covering their notebooks webcam? So it's basically the same idea. So you don't trust an uncovered camera. So how can we explore alternatives? So before I go to alternatives we might have a look at, I just want to take a step back and have a look at what had ha actually happened during our co-design sessions. So what had happened? We have had that design challenge. We wanted to come up with nice, novel, innovative privacy indicators. And there's a range of possible solutions. One of them are LED status lights. But what our participants did is that they converged very early in their ideation on LED status lights. And to be honest, this was certainly not our participants' fault. So we have had the same bias in our research team. Our first ideas all were like, lit up icons, point light displays. So it was definitely not the participants' fault and we needed to do something about that. So what to do? What we actually wanted in our sessions was to have a process of divergence first. So explore all possible options first before actually deciding on one solution and elaborating on that. So how can we foster this process of divergent thinking in design sessions? Well, we looked into methods and one of those methods I'm 
I have decided to take with me today and I will just walk you through it. So today we are going to have a look at the so-called lotus, lotus blossom method. The lotus blossom method or sometimes also lo lotus flower method is a method for group brainstorming that has originated in the 1990s and was first described by Sheridan Tatsuno, whom you can see here on the picture, um, in uh, the context of innovation in Japan. And the general idea is that similarly to how those petals of the lotus flower, as you can see on the picture, are arranged around the center, you arrange possible solutions around a particular design question. So this might actually look like this. So we can start from that process and then iteratively refine our ideas. What did we do? We asked our participants to come up with ideas for applications that can be enabled with wearable smart cameras. So why did we do that? not ask directly for privacy indicators. So as we wanted to grow broad, we thought it would make sense to start with something general our participants can easily relate to and also immerse themselves in uh, the use case they're working on. So we had this question and we asked our participants to come up with eight potential ex uh, applications. Might of course also be seven or nine or any other number. Uh, you can come up with. And then in a second step, we ask them to select their three favorite application scenarios. So those might have been application scenarios where they, they, they just found most interesting or most challenging. And we took those as the next, yeah, next centers of our next iterations of ideas. So those became the new centers and we just created new petals with the question, how could the camera communicate to bystanders that they are being recorded? And I guess you get the idea. In the next step, we again ask them to select three contact, concepts. But of course, those concepts don't need to come from each application scenario. They can be distributed just as you find them interesting or most promising. Those again, you get the idea, uh, become the new centers and we started generating design variants for each of those basic ideas of status indicators. So how does this look in practice? Huh? Sorry, I guess I need to start this. Yeah, so in those co-design sessions, uh, you'll see a very quick version up there. Uh, we asked our participants to work in pairs. However, there's no real restriction for that method in terms of how many persons can use this method as a team. You might even also work alone. Post-its also work fine, but so does anything else you can write on, ideally reposition, but you also might do this even di digitally. The Lotus Blossom technique is a problem solving approach. So where each successive step, so each of those iterations of petals, provides a more in-depth look at some potential solutions to the problem. And also it's highly structured, it at the same time fo fosters imagination and innovative thinking and at the same time, it's also easy to use and explain. So this was basically the perfect method for us. But now we basically ended up with a lot of different ideas and we're wondering, okay, how do we like select again? So we, of course, we also wanted to converge on certain ideas that then later could motivate our next steps. So, how could we do that? We found some inspiration at IDEO, a design thinking company, and they have that awesome tech box, which you can also see here in the pictures. It's a collection of interesting mechanisms and tangible artifacts that are meant to foster uh, discussions and design thinking. 
So we asked our participants to build tangible artifacts to visualize their ideas and to make them more concrete as a basis for a discussion. And the great plus, it's also great fun and really sparks creativity. So coming back to what we had earlier, we just pick one concept and build. And I was really excited about that because our participants got really creative. They came up with super awesome prototypes. One of them you can actually see here. Some were even a bit exaggerated, but then again, this was exactly what we wanted. And we collected from eight of those sessions, we collected eight tangible prototypes. And then we had discussions with them. So we took them as a basis for discussion and evaluation. And for this evaluation, we took evaluation criteria that were the issues identified earlier, which are uh, the problem with the LED status lights. So we looked into noticeability, understandability, trustworthiness, and security. Um, on the following few slides, I brought some examples of those prototypes. So I'm not going to walk you through all of them because that would just take too much time, but I brought some of my favorites. So one of those ideas was to use physical occlusion of the lens, of the camera lens, in some kind of a flower bud metaphor, which would be open for the camera when it's used and closed when it's idle. At the same time, they also used uh, color coding, as you can see here on the right, uh, to indicate different kinds of usages of this camera. So, for example, the white one for tracking functionality and the yellow one for a consistent storage of images in terms of video recordings. And during the discussion, our participants elaborated on these concepts and they found the ideas of using metaphors very intuitive and accessible for everybody. But on the other hand, uh, color coding was perceived very difficult because if this is a device you have never encountered before, which would be very typical if you're a bystander of such kind of device, how would you know what those, ca what those colors would mean? So if it's your own device, you can learn it. But if you're a bystander, you don't get a chance to learn. So another prototype I found really awesome uh, is this one. It's um, also a little exact exaggerated prototype. Uh, it's a printer. It's a camera that basically prints a kind of tangible artifact, hands it over to a bystander, and provides him or her with some kind of controls over the image. Of course, this is an exaggerated uh, design, maybe even a critical design, but we can easily transfer the concepts of handing over control to, let's say, a mobile phone app, which is something we know from our everyday lives. But the same criticism that applied to those printer prototype would also apply to the mobile phone app. So one of our participants stated that it's like a kinder surprise. Only when you have been captured, you can choose what to do. So the issue here is timing. Ideally, you would provide bystanders with an option to select their privacy preferences before they're being captured, not afterwards. And this is really greatly visualized in this prototype. So as I said, I'm not going to walk you through all prototypes today, but, well, we ended up with eight artifacts, but what else? So, throughout those discussions of the artifacts, we analyzed them and identified six design strategies that then can provide starting points for later product design and also motivate some design recommendations. So, to improve noticeability, it's not only important to make those indicators noticeable, but also combine them with an option to, for bystanders to pri provide consent in a meaningful way. So a bystander also has to be informed that there's an option to provide or withdraw consent. 
which is also part of noticeability. And second, understandability is also key, as bystanders typically don't have a chance to learn the meaning of certain UI elements. So indicators should be used that don't require learning or any prior knowledge, which is very difficult if you use color coding or rely on text messages or, ice, uh, or icons. Last but not least, to improve trustworthiness, it makes sense to provide some kind of reassuring mechanism, as for example, physical occlusion of the lens, and also adapt to the context. Some contexts might be very privacy sensitive, where you want to have cameras maybe with a lens covered by all means. Some other contexts might, more flex might be more flexible. So this is basically what we obtained from the whole process and which we used for our later research. So what did you learn today? So if you faced a problem that your participants in co-design sessions or you and your team uh, converge too early on a maybe established design strategy, Try to create a structure for, uh, for design sessions that balances divergence, coming up with many different ideas first, and convergence, where you pick out the most promising ideas. The lotus blossom technique, which I introduced today, is a great and easy possibility to do so, but of course not the only method that can achieve this. Also, if you are facing abstract concepts that are maybe hard to grasp. Think of visualizing them as tangible artifacts. They, those might be crafted low fidelity prototypes, even crazy, exaggerated, or not yet realizable ideas. But it's fun and it can facilitate dealing with abstract concepts and coming up with new solutions. So I hope you can take some of those ideas with you. And I have one more slide where I wanted to show you what we actually made out of this whole process. So what I'm currently working on. Uh, this is one of my current research prototypes, which is, of course, still a little bit bulky and large. Uh, it's called Privacy, and it integrates a mechanical shutter with a front-facing camera which is closed when there are privacy sensitive situations detected. Um, but of course, situations may change. And if the camera can detect those changes, how to reopen the shutter again. And for this, we are using machine learning and eye tracking to detect situation changes and to figure out when it's safe to open those shutter mechanisms in front of the front facing camera again. So, this is what basically came out of the whole process of those eight physical artifacts. And with this, I'd like to conclude my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions uh, regarding my talk, my research, or if you're just a student thinking of doing a PhD and want to know how it's like to be a PhD student, just come and find me afterwards. I'm happy to share some, kind of, some ideas. Thank you very much.